Steve, talk about the evidence for a design inside the code. And why don't you do this? Build this bridge because when most of us laymen think of a black box, we think of that which is indestructible inside a plane. And, and that's not the black box that, uh, that Mike was talking about. He was talking about Darwin could not see what was inside the cell. He believed that, in fact, if the cell was as complex as it was today, he may never have written the book. He would have surrendered at that point in saying, there is such genius inside of that. It, in fact, violates what he wrote as, in that one uh, quote that you had from Origin of Species. So let's go further now, not just in the complex machinery that Mike talked about. Let's talk about even a step beyond, which is the digital code embedded in that. There's a segment. It's necessary to build it. There we Absolutely. go. Absolutely. And hey, Mike, it, we're not used to getting that kind of a reaction. How did you warm them up like that? <laughs> um, all right, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about the digital code. I hope we get to talk a little bit more about that type three secretory thing later because uh, I've been working with one of, Mike one of Mike's colleagues who's a microbiologist who's been defending Mike's honor because that, uh, th there's, a, there's a genetic story behind that objection that I think has shown Mike to be entirely correct, but maybe we can come back to that in Q&A. Uh, my job tonight is to talk about the, uh, I think one of the most fascinating discoveries in the history of, of humankind, not just science, but it's, it is the discovery that Watson and Crick made of the digital code in DNA. The first thing they discovered in 1953 was the beautiful double helix structure of DNA. We all know this, this structure because it, it's, a, it's a cultural icon now. We know that DNA, uh, you convict criminals with their DNA. We see, we see DNA on all, all kinds of things. The, the double helix is, is an icon, but it, it's, it's a beautiful structure. But more important than the structure that Watson and Crick discovered is the, 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 the mystery that they solved and the mystery that they created. The first line of the book that I've, I've just completed is this. It's when Watson and Crick discovered the, the, the elucidated, the structure of the DNA molecule, they solved one mystery, but they created another. The mystery that they solved was the mystery of where hereditary information arises. Since ancient times, people have known that like begets like, that children are like their parents, that organisms are able to copy and replicate themselves in very similar form. And scientists have, have known that there must be some kind of signal, some sort of memory or, uh, that, that allows organisms to reproduce themselves. But where does that memory, that information, that signal re reside? Uh, when Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, there was a hint in the structure that suggested that the DNA not only has this beautiful helix, but it is embedding some kind of information down its spine. It was suggested by Watson and Crick in their very first paper that this might be the case. But in 1957, four years later, uh, Francis Crick, having taken stock of all the developments that were going on, not only in the DNA chemistry world, but also in the world of protein chemistry, put forward what I think is the, the, really the basis of modern biology, which is the sequence hypothesis. And in it he said that there, there are four chemical characters along the spine of the DNA, they're called bases or nucleotide bases, that function just like alphabetic letters in a written text or digital characters in a piece of machine code or software. This is known as the sequence hypothesis. According to Crick, it's not the chemical properties of these these, uh, these bases that is important. Rather, it's their arrangement, just as it's important, it's not important uh, what the, the, the weight or the, the composition of these Scrabble letters is, what's important is the way they're arranged to spell out a message. It's the sequence of the arrangement that's, that it determines the function, not whether, it's, uh, whether the letters are put on wood or, 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 or tile or plastic. Um, this was the sequence hypothesis. And here, here's a picture uh, of the DNA molecule. You see the double helix shape that's the, made of the sugar phosphate backbone on the outside. That's the medium of, of the genetic text, the genetic information. But the information is stored on the inside of the molecule in virtue of the specific arrangement of these, these particular characters. These, we represent them with A's, C's, G's, and T's. There are four different chemicals, and it's the arrangement of those chemicals, again, that determines the function of the molecule. Now, that's all well and good, but what exactly does DNA do? And Watson Crick said that the, the characters function like alphabetic uh, letters in a written text or like digital characters in a machine code. That's great, but what does the machine code do? What, uh, what do those instructions tell the cell to do? Well, right as Watson and Crick were 
elucidating the structure and the function of DNA, well, the structure of DNA, there was a parallel development in molecular biology in the area of protein chemistry. It started in the, about the same time, 1952, a scientist named Fred Sanger was discovering uh, about the protein uh, insulin. Other scientists began to, to, to discover the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And that they, did, they discovered that they were immensely complex, three-dimensional shapes. Just, it, it defied everybody's expectation. They thought proteins were going to be simple things like hat boxes stacked up on top of each other. The ultimate secret of life, after all, should be law-like and orderly. But proteins weren't like that. We know that proteins do, and they knew that proteins did lots of important jobs in the cell. You can think of proteins as like the toolbox of the cell. Inside the cell, or, or in a toolbox, you've got a hammer, a, a, a wrench, uh, a saw, you've got a plane, all these things have performed functions and they perform the specific functions they do in part because of the specific shapes they have. The same thing is true of proteins. They have very irregular, complicated shapes and in virtue of those shapes, the proteins are able to do specific jobs in the cell. Here's just a simple illustration. You have a protein that acts as an enzyme, it catalyzes a reaction, in this case a reaction that breaks apart two sugar molecules. But the ability to break apart that disaccharide depends on a very precise three-dimensional fit between these two molecules. The disaccharide nestles into those two grooves in this particular enzyme. And everything in biology works according to that same kind of specificity of fit. Proteins make up the the structural parts of those nanomachines that Mike Behe was talking about, all those parts in the bacterial flagellar motor and other nanomachines are made of proteins. They fit together and form the machine because of very precise hand and glove fit between the parts. Same thing is true for enzymes catalyzing reactions. Same thing is true for proteins that help process the information in the cell. All proteins function because of this very precise three-dimensional specificity. How do they acquire that specificity? Well, we now know it has a, a hand and glove fit, another, another take on specificity. Uh, we now know that proteins acquire that specificity because of the way their individual subunits are arranged. Now, the subunits of proteins, that sounds like a big scientific word, but hey, I've got snap lock beads tonight. <laughs> Ages two to four, it says on the box, okay. All my best visual aids are stolen from small children, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's a, a protein is a, a long chain like molecule that folds into a very specific shape. And it might fold differently depending on the arrangement of the subunits, the amino acids. So each of these colored beads with a different shape represents a different amino acid. And you can see that there's a lot of different ways that we could arrange even just these few beads. Depending upon the arrangement, the shape will be different it will fold in the protein, or the, the, the chain will fold into either a functional protein, or it may lay, lie limp and, and do nothing at all if the arrangement isn't correct. So the amino acids, and there'll be a, a test on this particular, these equations afterwards, um, the amino acids are sequenced in very particular ways so that the protein folds in the right, in, in the right way. Get the, get the sequencing wrong, you don't get a functional protein. So, so uh, Francis Crick, in fact, said that that uh, he likened the amino acids to those old um, typeface blocks that are used in the, um, in the old newspaper headlines. It, it, they all have the same basic chemical structure, but there's a different sticky outie with each one, a different font, and those, the arrangement of those sticky outies determines the, more technical terms, sorry, and it determines the, the folding and therefore the function. Okay, so we, we like to say that, that amino acids have a property, or proteins have a property called sequence specificity. If something has sequence specificity, the function of the whole de de is determined by the specific arrangement of the parts. We find that in language, we find that in computer codes, we find it in, in proteins. But the question is, how do proteins acquire that specificity? And this is where where Francis Crick's sequence hypothesis came in. According to, to, to Crick, the characters along the DNA spine function like alphabetic letters, but the, what, they're, what they're spelling, what, the, what they're, they're causing to happen is the sequencing of amino acids, which in turn cause the proteins to fold and therefore produce a functional tool in the, in the cell's toolkit. So information on DNA is 
transcribed, translated, and produces this, the, the functional outcomes, the, the, the protein machines that the, the cell needs to survive. So you've got a form of functional information, sometimes referred to as machine code or assembly instructions in the DNA molecule. Now, this is what I call the DNA enigma. And I, would, I, I, said, I said at the beginning of my book that Watson Crick solved one part of that enigma. They solved the question of where the information, where biological information resides. It resides along the spine of the DNA molecule. They also helped us with the sequence hypothesis to understand what that information does. It helps, it, it, it directs uh, the building of proteins. But it raised another, their discovery raised another even more profound mystery. And that mystery is, where did that information come from? Where did it come from? 